Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Marlbrook Baptist Church. Good to see each of you this morning. Praise the Lord for the opportunity to be in his house. If you're good, glad to be here this morning, say amen. 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 Wonderful to be in the Lord's house. Good to see each of you. Pray that the Lord blesses in the service this morning in all parts of the service uh, that the Lord blesses and praying that we prepare our hearts and open our hearts uh, to be receptive and responsive to the moving of the Lord today. It is good to be in his house. We're going to start off with uh, Christian Miller is going to come and read Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8, and then Brother Randy will lead us in the song. Christian, you come on. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him in the, with, his, with the whole heart. They also do no, they also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have, when I shall have learned thy righteous judgment. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. All right, if you want to get your hymn book, you can turn to hymn number 63 of the words that be on the screen for glory to his name. Let's all stand together as we sing. His name. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and the choir will sing for us. Father, it is good to be in your house. Lord, I've enjoyed being here this morning. Lord, as we met together in the Sunday school hour, Lord, as we shared prayer requests with one another and lifted our hearts up in prayer before as we looked into your word. Now, Lord, as we gather together for the worship service, Father, it's good to be in your house. It's good to be among your people. And Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have, Lord, to be able to come together and knit our hearts together and lift our hands in praise and worship to you. Father, I 
I pray that you will meet with us this morning. I pray, dear Lord, you'll be in every part of the service. Lord, bless as the choir sings. I pray you anoint them. I pray you be with the others that are singing special music this morning. Lord, I pray you anoint them, anoint the songs that they sing that will minister to our hearts. Lord, as we lift our voices in congregational worship, I pray, dear Father, Lord, that we'll sing with our hearts and our minds towards you. And Father, Lord, that we will recognize you and praise you for who you are, Lord, as we open your word in a little bit and uh, study, Father, the word that you have given us, Lord. I pray it'll be applicable. I pray, dear Lord, that it'll, it'll minister to our hearts. And Father, Lord, that you'll meet with us. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being in your house. Bless now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Stand, turn around, shake hands with one another as the choir comes down. to see the family of God worshiping together. As you make your way back to your seat, you can go ahead and be seated. Have a few announcements to go over this morning. 
Do appreciate each of you being here. Thank the Lord for your faithfulness to his house. Nothing encourages a preacher like seeing you in your pew. And boy, I'll tell you what. So thanks to each of you for being here. Thank you for your faithfulness to come to the Lord's house. If you're visiting with us this morning, there in the pew in front of you, you'll see something sort of like this, a visitor's card. If you fill that out and drop it in the offering plate here in just a moment, uh, we would love to uh, send you an information packet, some information about the church and our ministries and all also a free gift to let you know we appreciate you visiting with us. So if you're here this morning, you're a visitor, uh, even if you've visited for a couple times, you've never filled one of these out. If you fill one of these out, we'd love to send you a gift in the mail and let you know we appreciate you being here with us. A couple of things uh, to remember this morning, this morning, or actually it'll be afternoon by then, uh, but we will be having a mission trip meeting immediately after this service. Uh, so we were looking to take a mission trip, have a mission trip scheduled for for August, uh, towards the middle of August, that date is not working for a lot of people who are interested in the trip. Uh, so there are some other options, but I want to meet with everyone who is interested and see uh, if we can work something out. So after this morning service, if you are interested in the mission trip uh, at all, even if you were just remotely interested, meet with us in the uh, fellowship hall after this service so we can look through some options and make the best decision uh, what we will do concerning the mission trip. And so that'll be immediately after this service. Also, our wild game dinner is this coming Saturday. Be sure, be sure to invite folks. There should be plenty of postcards. If they're not, see me, I'll get you some more, but should be plenty of postcards. Take these. Invite your friends and their families to come out to our wild game dinner. We're looking forward to a wonderful time, exciting time. Uh, so a couple of things I need in regard to that. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Uh, if you are planning to bring a dish, uh, please sign up on that sheet, notate uh, who you are and what you plan to bring, whether you're planning to bring a side, a dessert, or a wild game dish uh, so that Miss Bonnie uh, can look at that and she can know uh, what we have. The church will be providing chicken, uh, so we'll have fresh wild chicken from Kenny's here, uh, so uh, that'll be here, but the church will be providing chicken, but then we need you to bring your wild game dishes, uh, whatever it is that uh, that you like to cook up. Maybe you can trap some muskrat or catch a pick up a roadkill possum, you know whatever it is you like to eat, you know, you can grab that and cook it up and bring it, but looking forward to having some good dishes at the Wild Game Dinner. Looking forward to having a wonderful time. Also, uh, we for help with decorating, for help with decorating, uh, I'm looking for some folks that have uh, turkey mounts, a mounted wild turkey, or fish mounts. Now, please, please don't show up. 10 minutes before start time and come walking in with your mount. If you have a mount and that you're willing for me to use, let me know early this week. I'll meet up with you and get that so it can already be displayed before Saturday night. But if you have a turkey mount or a fish mount that you would let us use for decorating, uh, get in touch with me and let me know and we'll try to get some of those uh, displayed. We just need a few, but we do need a few. So if you can let us know, we'll get that displayed. But looking forward to a wonderful time uh, as you invite folks. Some of the things that will be given away as far as door prizes uh, which uh, Miss Sarah uh, made us some custom fish Fishing lure. So everybody that attends will get a custom fishing lure. It says Marlbrook Baptist Church on it. I don't know if that will attract fish or not. But anyway, we have custom fishing lures. Everybody will get one of these custom fishing lures. Appreciate Miss Sarah making those for us. Uh, and then we've got uh, three Yeti coolers that will be given away. Uh, we've got some Yeti thermoses will be given away. Some Yeti tumblers will be given away. Uh, also, uh, we will have some ammunition. We're going to give away a good bit of ammunition this year. So that will be something fun to give away. Uh, and then we have, uh, we'll have some uh, small gifts, some uh, fishing equipment. Uh, I know that we're going to have at least a couple custom turkey calls we'll be giving away. Uh, so looking forward to that. So let folks know uh, that there will be some great door prizes uh, to come out and be a part of it. Uh, looking forward to it. We will have a, a fish biologist from uh, Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries will be here with us. He'll be talking to us about the fish hatchery program, trout stocking, how that works in our state. Uh, then we also have West Virginia State turkey calling champion will be here. 
here, and he will be talking to us about how to coax a turkey. And so those of you that hunted yesterday and didn't have any luck, maybe he'll give you some pointers. Uh, but he'll be talking to us about how to call a turkey. We're hoping to have a turkey calling contest. So if you know how to call a turkey, we will be having a turkey calling contest. If you don't know how, you can still try. So uh, uh, we'll just be calling folks uh, from the floor, have uh, four or five contestants, and be doing uh, just a, a brief, fun turkey calling contest. Uh, so uh, everyone will have an opportunity to win. So just keep that in the back of your mind, uh, you know. But uh, anyway, looking forward to that. Some other fun activities. So it'll be a great time. Be sure to invite folks to come out and be a part of our wild game dinner. This evening, this evening, I want to mention this. If ushers want to go ahead and come forward, we'll get ready to receive the offering. Uh, but this evening, Brother Bill Dillon. Brother Bill Dillon is our missionary to Israel. Uh, Brother Bill Dillon has recently came home from Israel. He's been in Israel, uh, and he's just recently came home, and he will be with us tonight. Brother Bill Dillon will be with us tonight. He'll be giving some updates about what is going on in Israel, uh, and he'll be preaching for us. We had two missionaries scheduled for tonight, uh, Brother Bill Dillon and Brother Cody Crevar. Uh, Brother Cody also had Wednesday open, and uh, so he has he will be here Wednesday evening. So Brother Cody Crevar will be here Wednesday evening. That way both of them will have more time, be able to share their ministries. Uh, so do your best to be here this evening. I know you'll enjoy hearing from Brother Bill Dillon. I know you'll have some uh, good perspective to give us uh, having been there on all that's going on in Israel. So do your best uh, to be here this evening. I'm going to ask Brother Seacox if he would pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've given us, Lord, Father, to see this creation and all its majesty today, Lord. We just thank you and praise you. Father, we just pray, thank you most of all for Jesus, our Savior, and Redeemer, and went to that cross of Calvary and shed his blood for our precious sins, for our sins, Lord. And Father, we just pray that uh, if there's anyone amongst our midst here that doesn't know the saving grace of Jesus, Lord, that Father, today would be the day they would come to know you. Lord, we just ask the blessings on this offering. Use it for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' precious holy name we pray. Amen. 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 I've heard it all my life. Even had it memorized. But it was only words to me. Red letters on a page, just something people say, till it brought me to my knees. Those words in John 3.16, for God so loved the world he gave, gave his only son away, a way to save a wretch like me. Me, the one who needed grace, grace to cover every stain, stains that he no longer sees. It's amazing to believe that God so loved the world means even me. How could he see my sins and forgive me even then? Who would pay that kind of price? I've seen what mercy does. He found me where I was. And he gave his life for mine. For God so loved the world he gave. Gave his only son away. A way to save a wretch like me. Me. The one who needed grace, grace to cover every stain, stains that he no longer sees. It's amazing to believe that God so loved the world means even me. Me with all my failures, me with all my shame. It's the very reason Jesus came. For God so loved the world, he gave, 
gave his only son away this way to save a wretch like me me the one who needed grace grace to cover every stain stains that he no longer sees it's amazing to believe that god so loved the world means even me it's amazing to believe that god so loved the world means even me Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hot Rod. Beautiful job. Beautiful song. All right. If you want to get your hymnals again, 633, Hold the Fort. We'll sing all four stanzas. of times I've had questions in my mind I've been scared but I know that I have a Savior who knows right where I am and hears my prayers in the midst of all my problems and burdens of this life I will call upon the one who can get me through the night. Lord, hold my hand in the middle of my storm. When I'm sinking down, Lord, help me stand. When the waves are crashing round, may I keep my eyes on you. Cause Lord, you're the I don't 
don't know how the story will end. I didn't see this in the plans you have for me. But I know that I can trust in the one who's working all things for my good. Though I may not know the answers till I reach the other side, I will keep my eyes on Jesus till my faith becomes sight. Lord, hold my hand in the middle of my storm when I'm sinking down. Lord, help me stand when the waves are crashing round. May I keep my eyes on you, cause Lord, you're the only one who can help me get through the middle of my storm. Lord, you're greater than my problems, greater than my fears. You are greater than my weakness, greater than my tears. You have never let me down. You are here When I'm sinking down, Lord, help me stand. When waves are crashing round, now I keep my eyes on you. Because, Lord, you're the only one who can help me get through. You are the only one who can help me get through the middle of my storm. Brother Danny, appreciate that. Brother Danny and I were talking this morning about how many folks are just facing storms. Mentioned it again in this Sunday school lesson. People everywhere facing storms. I imagine everyone in here has something or someone they know that's facing a storm. Everybody is facing storms. Isn't it wonderful that we have a Savior that can walk with us through the middle of the storm. Boy, I tell you what, thank the Lord for that. Turn in Bibles, Romans chapter number 6 this morning. As you turn in there, I do have a couple of prayer requests I want to mention to you this morning. <clears throat> Miss Stephanie Tyree's mother, Miss Sharon Rhodes, uh, is in the hospital. Uh, she's been losing a lot of blood, and they're not sure why she's losing the blood, uh, but uh, they Went, she went to the hospital this past week uh, and has continued to lose blood while there at the hospital uh, to the point that now she's uh, getting weak to the, to the point that they gave her a test this morning. She was a, unable to stand up for the test. Uh, so they're running more tests tomorrow. Uh, pray that they be able to diagnose what this is. And so Miss Stephanie asked we definitely be much in prayer for her mother, uh, that the Lord will be with her. And then also Brother Matt asked that we pray for Henry. Uh, Henry's not doing well today, so do pray that the Lord will uh, be with Henry and touch him. And then also there's a family, uh, uh, the Connor family, uh, lost a 16-year-old daughter this, this weekend. And so pray for that family. Boy, I'm telling you what, there's, there's storms all around. And boy, I'm telling you, we never know what other folks are going through, what they're facing. Let's remember to pray for one another. The Bible says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so let's be people that pray for one another. So as you go through your day, remember these folks and do be in prayer for them. Romans chapter number 6, Romans chapter number 6, we started last week looking at the subject of sanctification and this week we are going to continue that uh, looking at the practical application of sanctification. Uh, my son Joel told me, he said at dinner last Sunday, he said, uh, I listened to your message and I thought, wow, this is a good all comprehensive 
message about sanctification. He said, then you ended with saying that we were going to be looking at this for several weeks. He said, and I was like, what? That wasn't all of it. And so, but there is definitely much to be considered about the subject of sanctification. Last week, we looked at the beginning of chapter number 6, actually verses 1 down through verse number 14, and we saw that Paul gave us a detailed explanation of what sanctification is, uh, how it uh, how it works. Uh, uh, throughout the book of Romans, Paul has been giving us a detailed uh, explanation of the gospel. What is the gospel? Uh, it is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he's given us an explanation of how the gospel works in the life of the individual. And he begins with showing us, of course, uh, our condemnation. Then he explains our justification, our salvation, how we come to know Christ. And now in chapter 6 through 8, he is working on the subject of explaining sanctification, which is holiness in the life of the believer. And so we saw how that he explained in verse 1 through 14 what it is, what sanctification is. And now this morning we're going to be looking at how to practically apply our knowledge to our lives. Knowing something and applying something is two completely different things. And so what Paul has told us what we know, uh, now he is going to tell us how to apply it. We saw last week that there are three aspects to sanctification. There is positional sanctification, which takes place at salvation, whereas we appear holy before God through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is practical sanctification, which is growing and learning the things of God, learning the, the, the principles of the Word of God, learning what God desires of His children, and learning to apply that to our life. And then we see that there is perfect sanctification, which takes place at the resurrection. That takes place at the resurrection. There are some who would, who would teach that it is possible to reach perfect sanctification in this life. Uh, whenever we teach that it's possible to reach perfect sanctification in this life, we misunderstand how corrupt we are. Because every day we can learn, we can apply, we can grow, and there will be another area that needs work done. And for all of our existence, there will continually be more and more and more areas that need to be worked on. Whenever we say that we sin every day, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are unable to overcome sin. Definitely there are sins that can be overcome and we should be overcoming sin in our life. It is possible uh, to determine that you are not going to partake in that particular sin to find victory and to live in victory in regard to that sin but that does not mean you are sinless. There are yet other areas that need worked on. There are other areas where we need to find victory and we will go throughout this Christian life. If we follow Christ, we will go throughout this Christian life constantly improving, constantly becoming more like Christ. But because we live in this corrupt flesh, we will not reach a state of perfection until the trumpet sounds, and then this mortal body will be glorified. And so we see that there's positional, there's practical, and there is perfect sanctification. We understand that we're made positionally holy at salvation. We're practically growing in holiness every day, and we will be perfectly holy at the resurrection. So in this message this morning, we're going to look at verses 11 down through verse number 23, the end of the chapter, and we're going to consider practically applying our knowledge of sanctification to our life on a day-to-day -day basis. So read with me, starting in verse number 11, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. Paul says, starting in verse number 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, lest that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? 
God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's been good to be in your house this morning. It's been good to be with your people. It's been good to worship together. It's been good to fellowship together. Father, I thank you for the privilege, uh, Lord, uh, that we have to worship you. I thank you, dear Lord, that you inhabit uh, the praises of your people. I thank you, Lord, that we're invited uh, to bring our worship into your presence. And Father, I thank you that you receive our praise and our worship. Father, I thank you for it. Now, Lord, we come to the time of the service when we open your word. And Lord, we're looking into your word, Father, because it's our desire to know you. It's our desire to understand you. It's our desire, Father, that we might be more like you. And so, Father, as we open your words this morning, I pray, uh, Father, Lord, that the, the message we share not just be uh, some sort of rhetoric or some sort of uh, something to make us feel good, but, Father, Lord, that what we look at this morning uh, will be something that's applicable, uh, something, Lord, that will bring understanding uh, something, Father, we can put uh, into shoe leather so that, Father, Lord, when we leave here, uh, Lord, we'll be better equipped, uh, servants of God, and, Father, Lord, we'll be better equipped uh, uh, to stand against the temptations of this world and the wiles of the devil. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word. Thank you, Lord, for inspiring uh, the writers to pin your word. Thank you, Father, for preserving your word. Uh, Lord, that we might have it, that we can refer to it. Let us never, let us never take it for granted. Let us never set it aside. Let us never never rely on the words of men more than on the words of God. Father, help us to esteem your word. And Lord, look to it constantly to be our guide and our foundation. Thank you for your goodness. Bless this morning, I pray, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Alrighty, this morning we're going to look here at the practical application of sanctification. As I said in our last message, we received an explanation, but in this lesson we will be learning an application. In our last lesson we saw three times, verse 1 down through verse number 9, three times that we can know that we are dead to sin and alive alive to God. Now in verses 11 to 23 we will see how to activate that knowledge. How to start living according to our knowing. And so we've got just a few things we're going to look at this morning concerning how to take what we know and apply it to our life. The first step in putting our knowledge into shoe leather so to speak is recognizing our freedom from sin, recognizing our freedom from sin. In verse number 11, Paul says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now when I read that verse there and I see the word reckon, I feel uh, that I have been uh, verified for the way that I talk, you know. A good old word reckon right here in the Bible, so apparently the way I talk is the right way to talk. Uh, many times we do hear the word reckon used. A lot of folks use the word reckon. And whenever we hear someone say reckon, uh, normally we would understand that they mean something similar to I guess so. Or it could be something like a <clears throat> maybe a hesitant yes. If I were to ask Brother Ted if I could borrow his truck, and Brother Ted said to me, I reckon, then I would understand that that meant yes, but I wish you hadn't have asked. <laughs> it would mean uh, go ahead. 
because I can't figure out any way to say no. That's what I reckon means. Uh, and other ways that we'll use it, you know, the, uh, you'll be out doing some work and you know it's about dinner time and somebody will say to you, are you going to go eat dinner? And you'll say, I reckon I'm going to go eat dinner. What that means is, yes, I want to eat dinner, but I also want to finish this. You see, this is how we use the word reckon. But that is not the meaning of the word reckon here in Scripture. That is not at all what the word means. It's how we use it in our vernacular, but there's a completely different meaning here in the book of Romans. Matter of fact, this word reckon is used several times in the book of Romans, and in every instance, it means to count something as so to put it on your account, to write it down, to affirm it as fact. That would be the meaning of the word reckon, to count it as so, uh, to believe it, to write it down, to affirm it as fact. Paul says, likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Now in the previous verses 1 through 10, Paul has explained that we are dead to sin. He has explained that just as as Christ died and was buried, we symbolized that in baptism in that we died and was buried and that we were dead to sin. We were resurrected to live a new life. Paul has explained this. Now he comes to verse number 11 and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write it down. I want you to put it to your account. I want you to affirm it as true that you are dead to sin. I have explained it to you. Now I want you to start acting upon it. I want you to reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that since we know we are dead to sin, we are, should start acting like we are dead to sin. In other words, we should recognize, and this is so life-changing, and it's a doctrine that is so muddled, but it is clear in the Word of God. We should recognize that we are dead to sin. Sin no longer has any dominion over us. Now this means a couple of things. First of all, death has no more dominion over me. We know that the Bible says in the last verse of our passage that the wages of sin is death. But because I am freed from death, or freed from sin, excuse me, because I'm freed from sin, sin can no longer cause death for me. So I'm not under the dominion of sin in that I'm freed from death, but I'm no longer under the dominion of sin in that sin is no longer able to dictate my actions. We love, we love, we love to blame our wrong actions on anybody but ourselves. The devil made me do it. How many of you ever said that? We like to use that phrase, the devil made me do it. <laughs> Boy, we like to blame it on, well, I couldn't help myself. The temptation was too great. Recognize, Paul is giving you a powerful truth, and once you grasp this, it'll change your life. Sin no longer has the right to tell you what to do. No longer. Sin is dead. We are dead to sin. So Paul is saying we should recognize that we are truly and completely dead to sin and thus we are free from its dominion and its control over our life. After salvation, after we have been justified, we are free to choose who we will obey. Before salvation, the Bible describes our situation as being bound. The Bible describes our situation as being prisoners. The Bible describes our situation as being slaves to sin. We do not have an option. We are bound to sin. We are slaves to sin. But after salvation, we are dead to sin and we are free to choose, will I follow sin or will I follow Christ? Will I follow my fleshly desires or will I seek righteousness? Paul is telling us here's what is true and now he is challenging us to act on it. Uh, he's challenging us to begin making the choice to follow righteousness. 
rather than yielding to the temptation of sin. Paul's first instruction uh, deals with knowing. It centers on our mind. Paul's second instruction uh, deals with reckoning, which focuses on our heart. And now his third instruction that we're getting ready to look at here in this passage uh, touches our will. So we know it in our mind. We've reckoned it in our heart. Now how do we put it into our fingers. How do we make this work? In verses 12 and 13, Paul tells us how to practically implement our knowledge by yielding our actions to God. Paul tells us how to take our knowledge that we have reckoned to be so. He tells us how to do it by yielding our actions to God. Look at verse 12 and 13. He says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now whenever we look at this passage of Scripture, we see clearly that Paul is putting our actions in our own plate. He is putting the responsibility on us. He said, because you are dead to sin, because you are alive unto God, he said, here's what you need to do, is you need to control what you do. Don't yield to sin, rather yield to God. This is putting the responsibility on us. We have the knowledge of our death to sin. We have counted this knowledge as true. And now Paul is telling us, here's how you act on it. You choose who you yield to. Paul has told us that because we are dead to sin, we are free to choose who we will obey. So how do we do this? How do we choose who we will obey? First, we dethrone sin in our life. We dethrone sin in our life. In Romans 6 and verse number 12, he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Before salvation, sin and the desires of the flesh and gratifying the desires of the flesh set on the throne of your heart. Sin dictated your actions. Now as we said last week, this varies from person to person. The, the issues that one person struggles with may be completely different from the issues that someone else struggles with. What this causes is I may look and someone over here, and I might say, well, I don't have that problem, so I'm okay. This person may look at me and say, I don't have his problem, so I'm okay. And many times we like to judge our righteous standing based on what sins we're not committing that others are committing. The correct way to judge ourselves, the Bible says whenever we compare ourselves to one another, we're not wise. The correct way to judge yourself is to look at yourself in reference to the Word of God. And whenever you look at yourself in the mirror of the Word of God, you will find that before salvation, you were controlled by your fleshly lust and desires. You followed after what you thought was best for yourself based only upon your own gratification. This is how sin works. Before salvation, this is how you work. Now, after salvation, we are dead to sin through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been given liberty. Boy, we need to start preaching this more and more. It's something that's not preached anymore. But God is able to deliver you from whatever sin, whatever vice, whatever addiction has a hold of you. God has the power to deliver you. It's something that we don't anymore. Instead, we just justify and say you can continue living in it, but the Bible teaches that at salvation you are dead to sin. It no longer rules over you. It no longer rules over you. So what do we do? How do we do this? We dethrone sin. Whenever sin begins dictating what it wants you to do, you let sin know that it's not your boss anymore. You let sin know it's not the king anymore. You let sin know it doesn't sit on the throne of your heart anymore and that you are not required to respond to it. 
First, you dethrone sin in your life. Secondly, you decide who you will obey. Because we are flesh, because sin, and understanding this will help you, all sin is fleshly lust that are being gratified outside of the boundaries that God has set. All of that. So because we are flesh, there is always a temptation to gratify our fleshly lust beyond the boundaries that God has set. And so after salvation, we still have temptation to go beyond the boundaries God has set. But we can choose whether we're going to spend our life pursuing fleshly gratification or if we're going to spend our life pursuing righteousness. First, we dethrone sin. Second, we choose who we will obey. The, the old parable that's been used so many times uh, that makes such applicable sense is that inside of us is as if we have a black dog and a white dog. And whichever dog you feed is the one that's going to win the fight. It's a very down-to-earth practical application, but it makes sense. Uh, who you feed is who's going to win and you can choose what you're going to do. These choices happen on a daily basis. These choices many times happen on a second by second basis. But you can choose. You can make the choice. In the Bible we find examples of people yielding themselves to God and examples of those who yielded themselves to sin. We think of Moses God used the rod in Moses' hand to conquer Egypt. He used the sling in David's hand to defeat the giant. He used the mouths and tongues of the prophets to proclaim the word of the Lord. We've been studying on uh, uh, Wednesday nights of Paul's missionary journeys. God used Paul's feet to, to carry him from city to city. He used Paul's mouth uh, uh, to proclaim the word of God. He used Paul's hands to write uh, many of the epistles. Uh, uh, the apostle John, uh, uh, his eyes saw uh, what God was doing. Uh, uh, he heard what God was saying. He wrote it down in the book. Of Brother Danny been teaching through the book of Revelation because John yielded his members to God. Each of these individuals were used by God because they yielded their members to God. You remember the case of David. Uh, when David went to defeat the giant, uh, there were many people there who were better equipped physically to fight the giant than David was, uh, but they were yielding to themselves and their fears, uh, and they, they were yielding uh, to their fleshly benefit. Uh, but David yielded himself to God, and David defeated the giant. God can mightily use anyone who will choose to yield themselves to righteousness rather than continuing to live over the, under the bondage of sin. However, there are also accounts of people that yielded themselves to sin. David defeated the giant, but David is also the one who allowed his eyes to look at the neighbor's wife. He allowed his mind to plot a wicked scheme. He allowed his hand to write the order to murder her husband. He yielded to his fleshly gratification. And although the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart, all that you and I remember about David is his sin. We remember that he failed because he made the wrong choice. The Bible tells us that we can choose who we yield ourselves. David's confession of his sin is found in Psalm 51. And in his confession, David states that his whole body was affected by his sin. His eyes, his mind, his ears, his heart, his lips, his mouth. He yielded to sin and sin made a fool of him. Paul is here instructing us that after salvation, we have the choice who we will yield ourselves to, rather of, unto sin or unto righteousness. Paul is teaching that the obvious response to salvation is yielding to righteousness. So many, so many are teaching in our day that you get saved and you don't have to change anything. And it is a shame that there is a world full of people who profess to be Christians that don't look any different than the world. 
Paul is saying here that the obvious response to salvation is yielding to righteousness. You know, a question that you will hear oftentimes, and I understand that in some ways this is a, a verifiable question, but in some ways it's a revealing question. And the question is this, what is wrong with you fill in the blank? What is wrong with you fill in the blank? Now, in some ways, this is a verifiable question. If someone is earnestly seeking to live a righteous life, we understand that the Pharisees in the law, uh, they looked at the law of God and in an effort to become more righteous, they continued to add to the law and add to the law and add to the law. More and more restrictions, more and more laws, thinking that they were making themselves more and more holy. And there is a danger that someone who is seeking to live a righteous life could come under the teaching of someone who is is continually adding a lot of personal preferences as the law of God and putting them under a bondage that isn't biblical. And so they may ask, uh, what is wrong with, in an earnest question, asking, does the Bible teach that this is sin? Truly thinking that if the Bible does teach it, they'll change. But if the Bible doesn't teach it, then they're not going to put themselves under the bondage. But many times that question is a revealing question. And the revealing question is this, that... I prefer my old master. I don't want to give this up, so unless you can prove to me that it's wrong, I'm going to continue doing it. We see here, we see here that the obvious response to salvation is choosing righteousness. The third thing that we see this morning about yielding ourselves to God, in verse 14 down through the rest of the chapter, Paul shares the motivation for yielding to God. What, what is the motivation that causes me to yield to God? What, what is it that makes me want to do that? We used to have a little dog. She was part beagle, part dash hound. Her name was Ivy. She was a smart little dog, but she was a stubborn little dog. And she knew a lot of tricks. She knew how she knew how to sit and shake and, uh, and all sorts of things, you know, that dogs do. But one thing that we would do is we would tell her to lay down. Ivy did not like to lay down. She knew what it meant. She knew that she had to lay all the way down with her paws like this and her little nose on her paws. She knew what lay down meant, but Ivy did not like to lay down. She did not like that trick at all. Ivy didn't like to do that trick. Now you tell the Ivy, say, Ivy, lay down, and she just look at you. Lay down, Ivy. she just look at you. And then you'd reach over and you get that dog biscuit. Lay down, Ivy. Poof. She was motivated. <laughs> Something motivated her to choose to do what we were asking her to do. That dog biscuit said, all right, it's worth it. I'll lay down for them if I get that dog biscuit. So what motivates me to choose, what motivates me to choose righteousness? We know the Bible says that there's pleasure in sin for a season and that brief pleasure that accompanies sin oftentimes blinds people to a more distant outlook and they just live in the moment and constantly choose that initial gratification. What motivates them to righteousness? What motivates us to choose righteousness? We have three things here. I'll try to move through them quickly for you this morning. Three things that I believe motivate us, should motivate us to follow God rather than allowing sin to reign in our body. First, we should be motivated to yield ourselves to God in response to His favor. We should yield ourselves to God in response or responding to His favor. Look at verse 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. This is very similar to verse number 1 where Paul said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. They say here, Should we sin because grace covers me, because grace takes care of my sin, because grace it has, has uh, overshadowed me, I shouldn't have to worry about sin, right? I can continue sinning because grace has taken care of it. And Paul said, Says, God forbid. How could you even think that? Grace should not make you want to continue sinning, but grace should motivate you to choose righteousness. How so? Let's look at what we see here. How so? 
It is because God's grace that we have been forgiven. We do not deserve forgiveness. There is nothing in us that has earned forgiveness. It is because of God's grace that we are forgiven. It is because of His grace that we have been given salvation. It is because of His grace that we have the promise of an eternal home in heaven and the response to an undeserved pouring out of grace like that would motivate us to yield to Him. I was undeserved. I was condemned. I was condemned because of my sin. Because of my sin, I was condemned. Yet God in His grace said, I will cover your sin. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God said, I will cover your sin. I will wash away your sin. I will make you a child of God. Nothing that we did on our own, nothing that we could have done on our own. And people say, oh, because... God's grace covers me, I can keep sinning. No! Why would you think that? Your sin has separated you from God. Your sin caused a division. Your sin is offensive to God. Why would you desire to continue in sin? His grace ought not be used as an excuse to sin, but rather it ought to be a motivation to choose righteousness because of the grace of God. We see that we respond to his favor. Second, we see we're motivated to yield ourselves to God when we realize our freedom. When we realize our freedom. Look here with me. Starting in verse number 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Brother Luke Fisher preached a few Sunday nights out of this passage concerning being slaves to righteousness. Did a phenomenal job. I encourage you to go listen to that message. Whoever you yield to, they are your master. Many people like to claim that they're their own master, but that's never true. If you're claiming that you're your own master, you are following your own selfish desires and gratifications and you've become the slave of sin. So you're never your own master. You're either the slave of sin or you're the slave of righteousness. And so we see here that he says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Look at verse number 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. The illustration that Paul is making here of master and servant is obvious. Whether you, Whoever you yield to is your master. Before salvation... We were the slaves of sin. Now that we belong to Christ, we are freed from that slavery. And when we obey Christ, we are made, we become his servant. The Bible tells us in verse number 26 that the unsaved person is free. Free from righteousness. I often refer to this verse whenever people talk about wicked people behaving wickedly. They, that's what wicked people do. That's what unsaved people do. They are free from righteousness. They are slaves to sin. This is how they're going to behave without Jesus. And any effort to reform them without salvation is going to be fruitless because they're slaves to sin. They're free from righteousness. And because they're free from righteousness, they claim a freedom that is false. You ask someone who's living a loose life if they're in slavery and they'll laugh at you and say, No, no, I'm free. I'm not bound by anything. I do whatever I want. But that freedom that they're rejoicing in will ultimately destroy them. A great example was in Luke 15 when we read of the prodigal son. The prodigal son wanted freedom. He wanted out from under dad. He wanted money. He wanted good life. He took what dad gave him. He went into the far country and he began to pursue freedom. He spent all of his money pursuing freedom. Freedom. No rules, nobody telling me what to do. Living a free life. That free life that he was living put 
him in slavery. The prodigal son found himself in a pigsty wishing he could eat the pig's food, but he was free. No, he wasn't free. He was living the worst kind of slavery. And this is exactly what sin will do. Those who pursue sin in, in d- saying that they are living a free life are imprisoning themselves. So how do we, how do we avoid that? We, we recognize, we realize our freedom. The prodigal son was a slave of wrong desires. He was a slave of wrong deeds. Uh, he became a slave uh, in a wrong place. Uh, and the prodigal son never found freedom until he went back uh, to the father. And he said, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me as one of your servants. Why? Because being a slave uh, of a good master is the best freedom you'll ever get. He came back and he said, make me your servant because then he would have true freedom. That is the same that's true for a Christian. You pursue sin, it will enslave you. You pursue Christ, he will give you freedom. It was only when he yielded himself to the Father that he found freedom. Those who choose to yield to sin claim they are free, but their master, sin, will bring them to death. However, those who yield themselves to God will find a life of righteousness, peace, joy, satisfaction that is free of the guilt and the shame that accompanies a life of sin. This leads directly into the third motivation for obedience, which is receiving eternal fruit. Receiving eternal fruit. What motivates us to yield to Christ receiving eternal fruit. He says in verse number 21, he he gives us the fruit of sin, the fruit of sin. He says, What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. Paul here is referring, he's answering the question, well, since there's grace, can I continue to live in sin? Jesus says, What fruit? did you have in those things that you should now be ashamed of? Going back to chapter number 1, chapter 2, chapter number 3, where Paul describes the condemnation of the sinful man. And now they're saying, well, because of grace, I can continue to live that way. Paul says, what kind of fruit did that sin give you? What what benefit did you find living in those things that you should now be ashamed of? Why would you want to return to that? He said, because the end of those things is death. Why would you want to return to something whose end is death? Why would you want to go back there? So we see first, we look at the fruit of sin, but then in verse number 22, he speaks of the fruit of righteousness. He said, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Paul says, why would you want to go back to a sin that was going to bring death, a sin that separated you from God, a sin that was bringing condemnation? Why would you want to go back and partake in that when you know that all it brings, its only benefit, its only result is death? Why would you want to go back to that when in turn you can choose, you're free from it? You don't have to live under it. You can choose righteousness. The end of righteousness is holiness and everlasting life. Now, whenever you say that, those who want to continue in sin say, why would I want to pursue holiness? That's the opposite of what I want to do. Because God created you to be in a relationship with Him. You are designed to do what what God to have a relationship with God. This is what you're designed to do. And you will have your best life when you are doing what God has designed you to do. But if you refuse, you will live a life of empty pursuits that end only in death. You say, well, I thought that once I was saved, I was always saved. It didn't matter what I did. That's absolutely right. The Bible does tell us, however, that there's a sin unto death. And I wouldn't say that you pray for it. 
Bible tells us in Corinthians, he said, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, meaning death, because they refused to follow God. Why would you go back and live a lifestyle that only results in death when you have the freedom to choose righteousness, holiness, and everlasting life? Why? Would you make that choice? He summarizes everything in verse number 23 when he says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we use this verse and rightfully so. We use this verse when we're speaking to unsaved people about their need of salvation. And it definitely can be applied there. But this passage is actually being written to Christians. And Paul is saying, why would you choose a life of sin when you have the freedom to choose a life of righteousness? Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. We looked last week at what sanctification was. This week we look at the practical application of sanctification. How do I, how do I apply what I know? You choose righteousness. You choose righteousness. Now a little bit ago I said that a question that's often asked and a verifiable question is what is wrong with? And a similar question will be, well, Pastor John, how do we know what sin is? How do we know what's right and what's wrong in this crazy world in which we live? And I say to you that there's many things that the Bible is very clear about and that's a good place to start. But then there's other things that there's varied opinions on. And I'll just give you a country example. I'm glad y'all country folk. I could never pastor a city church because they wouldn't understand my examples. My dad took me in the woods when I was just a little fella and he was digging ginseng. And he said, now you see this here, son? This is ginseng. He took me over here. He said, this right here, this isn't ginseng. It looks like it, but it's not. This over here is it. I said, dad, how do I know the difference? He said, if you look at it and you say, is that ginseng? It's not ginseng. <laughs> but if you look at it and say, that's ginseng, it's ginseng. Now, this is just a simple example, but it definitely applies. If there is an activity that you are thinking about partaking in and you're like, is this, is this right? It's probably not. You probably should stay away from it. That little question coming up, is this, should I? probably the Holy Spirit nudging your heart. Now, it could be that it's something you've been taught. It could be that it's something someone's told you that's influencing you. And I encourage everyone to study the Word of God. I am thinking and praying about starting a study on Wednesday nights. Wouldn't be this coming Wednesday night, the next Wednesday night, looking at what does the Bible call sin. And so that's something I'm looking at and just looking at what does the Bible call sin and, and trying to get a grasp because we do live in a confusing world. But it's not as confusing as this world tries to make it. It's pretty obvious what's right and what's wrong. And if you're born again, you're dead to sin. Choose. You have the freedom. Choose righteousness. If you're here this morning, you've never accepted Christ as Savior. He can deliver you from whatever vice, whatever sin, whatever addiction that you're struggling to get rid of. He is able to deliver you. He can take you and turn you into a new creature. Come, put your trust in him, and let him make you dead to sin. I'm going to ask each of you to stand to your feet. As Miss Debbie comes to the piano, if the Lord spoke to your heart this morning, perhaps you're here and you're a Christian, and you're like, you know what? I've been choosing the wrong thing. I've not been living in the freedom that God gave me. And many times when the choice comes, I choose myself for my fleshly gratification and I'm continuing to live under the dominance of an old king. And I need help choosing righteousness. If that's you and the Lord spoke to your heart, you come. Perhaps you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior. Let me tell you, He can deliver you. Come and find freedom in Christ.
Amen. Thanks to each of you for being here this morning. Appreciate you being in the Lord's house. Praise the Lord. Spoke through his word. I pray that he clarified his word, and I pray that he challenged you to choose righteousness. Choose that life that he has promised us. Live a life of holiness unto God. Remember tonight, 6 o'clock, Brother Bill Dillon, missionary to Israel, will be with us. Do your best to be here. I know you'll enjoy the service. Enjoy what Brother Bill has to share with us. So do your best to be here. And those that are interested in the missions trip, uh, if you would, meet me down in the fellowship hall here in about five minutes, and uh, we'll talk about a few things to do with the missions trip. Thanks to each of you for being here. Brother Ronnie, will you pray and dismiss us from the service?